Hello, welcome to PCAP's webinar. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. This afternoon, Ruri Peter, Executive Director for the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, will be talking about the positive contributions of livestock and grazing systems. This is the final webinar in a series of webinars for our event, Prairie's Got the Goods Week. For other presentations that took place, please visit the PCAP YouTube channel. I would like to take a moment to note that Prairie's Got the Goods Week is presented by Crescent Point Energy, Wildlife Habitat Canada, and SAS Power, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. I'm happy to introduce to you today's presenter. Rory Peter grew up in Scotland in the West Highlands in a farming community where sheep and beef production were the main enterprises alongside sporting estates and forestry. He studied agriculture and had the chance to gain practical experience in New Zealand and Australia before managing a farm in southwest Scotland. He then took a Master's of Science degree and got more involved in development, working in Asia and Africa for several years working with farmers and livestock producers to access veterinary and other services and markets. He became involved in the formation of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef from its inception and was initial president and then executive director from 2012 to date. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Ruri. I'm not sure if you can hear me there, Ruri, but it looks like you're muted there. Just bear with us for a second. We'll just work on the sound here. Hmm. There we go. <laughs> I think we can. Oh, brilliant! Now. Go Thank ahead. you very much. <laughs> okay, now where am I? Can I, can we see my screen yet? Um, you just need to launch the broadcast or the the, okay. the PowerPoint there. Um. Okay. Is it now showing the right way around? Yes, perfect. Good to go. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And in spite of the slight technical issues at the beginning uh, and maybe the church bells in the background you can just hear, um, I'll start now. So thanks very much. And uh, I want to talk to you about the positive contributions of livestock and grazing systems. And I guess that in your series, a lot of people have, have touched on this um, and the very important role of uh, grazing lands, rangelands, prairies, etc., around the world and certainly in Canada. I'm not going to talk much about Canada, so hopefully I won't be um, covering the same sort of ground that every, everybody else has already covered. Um, but I think globally, rangelands are one of the largest ecosystems we have on the planet, and they're also a valuable and biodiverse type of ecosystem. They are, in fact, the most extensive um, on land. So they cover about, th it depends on who you read, but there are estimates between three and a half and uh, four and a half billion hectares of land on the planet. And uh, that's about half of the ice free surface of the globe. Um, they're highly biodiverse and they're, they've evolved with grazers. That's perhaps the most important thing to know about it. If you don't have grazing animals, your um, grazing lands, your rangelands are going to change in nature because grasses need to be grazed for their survival. They're, they're not like uh, other plants like trees and so on. 
Of course, you have a very wide range of different types of rangelands, some which are really grass, pure grass, and some which are much more covered in um, bush or you know, browse species. And these are these evolve in different environments according to basically the soil conditions, the, the amount of rainfall, the temperature, etc. But all in all, because they are so extensive, they're a very important uh, ecosystem in terms of, for example, soil carbon. And because they're so extensive, even though the soils may not have a very high concentration of carbon as compared to some deep uh, forest soils, for example, or, or peaty soils, because they're so extensive, they, they contain actually one of the largest reserves of carbon, soil carbon, that we can directly influence and manage. And that's, a, that's of key importance when we look at how we manage them. Unfortunately, because we've not always managed them well, about 70% of them around the world are currently degraded in some way. And that may be just from um, simple overgrazing, um, or it may be from prolonged uh, abuses of, of various different kinds. Now, overgrazing tends to be a function of the, the amount of time that they are grazed for, rather than purely a function of the number of animals. So what I mean by that is if you graze a grassland and then you allow it adequate rest after grazing it quite intensively, it will recover. But when, if you don't allow sufficient rest after the grazing, you will end up with uh, degradation of one sort or another. So overgrazing is, is really something that happens to plants. And the most palatable species are grazed preferentially. So the animals will keep going back to those, the most tasty plants that they find. And because they're constantly uh, nibbling at them when the plant is trying to recover from the last time it was eaten, they will eventually uh, die as a result. So you can stock a piece of land quite heavily and still it won't get degraded. It's just a question of how long you stock it for and how much time you allow it to recover. So grasslands are one of the most threatened ecosystems. And I'm sure that you will have already heard about this on some of your previous um, webinars. The Northern Great Plains in the US and in Canada are already one of the most threatened ecosystems there is, and about 47% of those grasslands has been converted for one purpose or another. And obviously one of the main uh, conversions is to crop land. So a lot of the, the wheat and the corn lands have been uh, converted from prairie. And in fact, the rate of conversion of the, of the Great Plains in North America has actually exceeded at times that of the Amazon rainforest. So moving on, this, this is an example of a grassland ecosystem. And you can see obviously there's some trees in there as well. But this picture is in Mongolia. And Mongolia is a country renowned for its livestock systems. And uh, basically the whole country is devoted to producing uh, livestock in one form or another. Uh, they produce a lot of small ruminants, sheep and goats, and they produce a lot of horses as well. They, they use horses uh, for, for their milk as well as for meat. And obviously small ruminants are both for um, meat as well as cashmere. So the rapid increase of the price of cashmere in the last few years has, uh, has meant that the flocks in Mongolia have expanded very uh, rapidly and that is causing problems in Mongolia where the land is uh, communal land. So when communal land uh, experiences a large increase in livestock you tend to end up with the same land being grazed continuously and that as I said before is can be a problem and that, that's when you start to see uh, degradation. And that is unfortunately what is now happening in Mongolia. This, this picture was actually taken last year and it was a very uh, dry year anyway. But uh, 
there were certainly signs that the, the land was, was suffering under the pressure of grazing there. And as I said, not, not the number of animals, because in this picture you cannot actually hardly see any animals, if any, but the fact that it was constantly being exposed to regrazing before the grasses had time to recover. Now, moving on, what I said before about grazing lands being a huge reserve of carbon and well-managed grazing lands being a, a, an important uh, sink for carbon in the atmosphere. Soil health really depends upon the amount of carbon in the soil and you can increase the health of the whole ecosystem if you can manage to increase that soil carbon. And how you do that is through good management, which I'll come back to in a little bit more. But the key issues that you will see when you increase the amount of carbon in the soil is that you get improved water infiltration and retention. In other words, the soil itself is actually able to hold moisture for longer. Um, so that's going to be very important at, at the end of a, a, a dry season, for example. It means that your grass will be able to continue to grow longer into the dry season. Um, it'll improve the soil nutrient status because of the structure of carbon. It's able to, to hold nutrients and plants will be able to access it better. You'll have more fungi and microbes and obviously plants as a result. The, the, the healthier the soil is, the more uh, vibrant the soil organisms will be. And because your plants are growing better and you have a better uh, operating uh, plant ecosystem, you'll also have more wildlife. And the nutrition for those animals will be better and the habitat will improve. And once you have good soil cover year round, because the plants are growing better, that will reduce the amount of erosion and also reduce the amount of emissions from the soil. So exposed soil, soil which is not covered by plants, will be uh, a source of emissions, whereas grazing lands which are um, covered and have no uh, bare soil will tend to be sinks. It's not automatically the case, but they will, they will be absorbing carbon, obviously, from the atmosphere for the plants to grow. And when they're well managed, they will be able to actually sequester some of that in the soil. And if we're talking about livestock, then um, livestock on good pastures, well managed pastures, are going to have better nutrition. They're going to be healthier, and uh, that's going to be more profitable for for the producer as well. So here's a picture of a rangeland in uh, in Colorado, in fact and obviously in the winter. And these, these kind of environments are very much appreciated by people from all walks of life simply for, for their recreational value. And it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be walking across it or, or uh, actually using the land, but just to be able to pass by it and see um, pasture land is valuable. And uh, people do appreciate them, but unfortunately these lands are not on the whole as profitable when they're under grass as they are when they're under crops. So where land can be converted for crops, uh, there tends to be an econ economic incentive for doing that. So we need to really find a balance between what is economically uh, feasible and what is actually useful in terms of biodiversity and environmental preservation. So, as I said before, grasslands involved with, evolved with grazing and grazing animals, and we need to have grazing animals on them to keep them that way. And the best way to manage them, not surprisingly, is to mimic the way nature would have grazed them as they evolved. So that's going to look a little bit different depending on where you are. And in some environments that's going to involve a range of different species and just as we were talking uh, before this webinar Caitlin was telling me that she's been out um, looking at bison and deer and 
animals and watching the letting grouse in the area where she is in Saskatchewan. In some other countries, you're going to have a similar range of species, certainly where I grew up in Scotland, a lot of the grazing land. We have a lot of deer there as well. And uh, it's, it tends to be all uh, tame now in Scotland, so most of the, most of the animals are domestic uh, cattle and sheep and so on, but we still have large numbers of deer. Um, but we need to manage those grazing lands uh, in a way that mimics what nature does uh, to, to improve the native uh, biodiversity. And as I mentioned before, we have grazing and rest, and in, in some countries where you've got grazers and browsers, in other words, you've got uh, bush species or uh, larger plants, not, uh, not grasses, then you'll need to have some browsing species in there as well, uh, which I'll show you in the next photo. This is, uh, this is in Botswana in the uh, Makari Kari and these are zebra as you can see. Now that particular grassland is really almost all grasses. There are there are quite a lot of uh, areas in Botswana where you've got uh, significant areas of bush as well. But here you can see the way a natural herd of zebra will graze. Now that as you can see they're really densely packed and although you can't see them all in one picture, there were about 25,000 zebra here in this, um, in this migration. And they move in these very dense uh, formations. And the reason they do that is that um, tends to protect them from predators to some extent. I mean, the, the ones who are out on the edges are always going to be the most vulnerable. But when you've got 25,000 animals in a, in a dense group, that will uh, protect the maximum number of them from uh, lion or whatever else are around. So they graze and they're constantly moving. This this uh, migration of zebra in Botswana tends to move um, several kilometers per day. So obviously with 25,000 animals it's spread out over several kilometers but by the time um, the last animals reach where the first ones were. You'll, you'll have, that'll have taken about a day for the whole uh, 25,000 of them to, to pass a given spot. And they won't come back here for several months. And the, the logic, th there is a logic to that. Um, animals obviously don't want to graze on land that they themselves have, have fouled. So as they're going along, they're, they're dunging and urinating on the land. And uh, they don't want to be grazing on that day after day. So they tend to graze on fresh pasture every day and they won't be back there for several months. And if you have the browse species, that's a little bit different. Where, where you've got thick bush or, or more uh, trees and bushes, you'll have a, a different range of species. You'll have more uh, antelopes and, and those kind of animals, which will be um, grazing at, well, browsing on the trees and on the leaves rather than on the grasses. And so you'll find mosaics of, of that sort of combination of grasses and uh, bush throughout Botswana. Anyway, it's a positive um, and very biodiverse uh, landscape. And it really supports a very high um, density of animals. Even in this uh, picture in Botswana, there's a, they only get about 14 inches of rain there, that's 350 millimeters. I don't know how that compares to where you are in Canada, but uh, it, it's quite dry because the temperatures year round are hot. I mean, we're talking about uh, summertime temperatures in, in the region of 40 centigrade. And in the winter, even though it gets cold at night, it'll still be 20 over day. So there's, there's no really cold time of year and there's, there's no major participation precipitation. They have, as I said, about 350 millimeters. Anyway, that's a, a positive picture in my uh, view and something that's definitely worth uh, preserving. Now, if we look at managed systems, so these are human managed systems, to try and mimic what nature is doing, you may have heard of the term amp grazing, sometimes referred to holistic grazing or cell grazing. There are a number of different terms for it. But essentially what you're doing with that is managing your pasture in a way that will 
expose it to fairly intense but uh, relatively short duration grazing followed by rest. And the amount of rest will depend upon your environment. If you have a higher rainfall environment uh, with a quicker cycling of nutrients and plants are recovering quickly because they have access to nutrients and water, then the cycle can be relatively quick. If you're talking about a place like um, I just showed you in Botswana, you may actually rest for, for an entire year after one grazing. So if I flick back here, you see here the amp grazing grass. It's, it's relatively short, it's quite dense, you've got good ground cover. And that picture on Botswana, even though the color of the grass is quite different, uh, you'll see that the, it's similarly thick and uh, a good covering there. There's very little bare soil. What happens if you've got light continuous grazing is so you can see there in the, in the top picture on the right hand side, uh, the grasses and the plants will grow very high, uh, right above the cow's head there. And she'll be grazing preferentially on, on the plants that she finds tastiest. But a lot of the um, material, a lot of the plant material there is, is not getting grazed at all. And it will tend to go rank and uh, just you're losing some of the productivity and you're also not keeping the plants and the, the, the grasses recycling nutrients as fast as they could be. In a way, that's just a suboptimal use of your, um, of your grasslands and you're also going to end up losing the most palatable species and you're going to encourage the growth of species that the cattle don't actually like. And depending on exactly where you are, that, that can lead to uh, degradation, just as much as too many animals continuously grazing could cause degradation. With no grazing at all, you'll, you'll also get this uh, rank vegetation and ultimately that can end up losing you your grassland. In some parts of the world, so if you did this in in Scotland and you didn't graze it at all, you'd, you'd get invasive species of, of trees, typically birch would come in and I guess in parts of Canada that might be the same, but it's probably harder to exclude grazing entirely in countries where there's a, a significant wild population of animals. But the basic message is if you don't graze, if you were not to graze in, uh, in Botswana, you would lose vegetation altogether because as the, the plants dry out at the end of the dry season, you'd have quite a large fuel load there that would either catch fire or gradually oxidize over the dry season and uh, gradually you'd lose grain cover and end up getting a, a sort of desertified situation. And this uh, bottom right hand picture is continuous grazing. Essentially that's just showing you uh, that you're getting bare patches in the soil between plants where animals are constantly going back to the, the tastiest uh, plants and eating them until they die and then you're opening up uh, empty spaces in, in the pasture. Okay, here's an example of um, exactly the same environment, obviously, with two different uh, grazing management uh, systems. And there, it's quite interesting because the, the one on the left-hand side there, and this picture is by Norman Crone, this is his uh, property in South Africa, is grazed every year and supports uh, more than twice as much livestock than the than the one on the sorry did I say that right the one on the right is uh, the bare one the one on the left is the the well vegetated one the one on the left supports twice as many livestock as the one on the right at least in fact the one on the right looks like it wouldn't uh, support anything at this stage and the way that Norman managed to restore his uh, vegetation in that picture is basically through what I'm talking about, through holistic uh, grazing, through um, moving the animals through there, grazing fairly intensively and then giving sufficient rest to the land. And that's an extremely dry area of the Karoo in South Africa. I think the total rainfall there is even less than in Botswana. Um, don't think I've got the figures for that, but uh, I know it's an extremely dry area. The Karoo is a high plateau in, in the central parts of South Africa and really quite a delicate area. 
And what happens when you continuously graze is, is the scenario on the right hand side of that picture. Uh, that's quite common in the Karoo because some of the land there is communal land and it's it's very challenging in um, situations where you've got communal land to actually manage the land properly because there's always somebody who wants to, to take advantage of the last bits of grazing. Our experience and, and my experience working in Southern Africa is when you work with communities uh, on communal land, you basically have to get everybody uh, involved so that they work together and pool their animals into one herd or one flock um, so that they're all grazing at the same time in the same place and then you you can be sure that you're going to have rest after that. Now throughout Africa there are a lot of challenges with communal land because of um, it's not always assigned to a specific community and in some countries that leads even to, to warfare because if it's not entirely clear who has the right to graze land then you'll always have people competing for that resource and specific examples of that if you think of the um, the area of Uganda northern Uganda called Karamoja uh, it's all a pastoral area the Karamojong uh, tribes live there and they've lived there for millennia with their cattle but they're constantly competing and fighting each other uh, for access to that land. Anyway, to, to the more positive side uh, of livestock and how you can manage them and, and benefit your land, things I mentioned before um, are actually things that this adaptive multi paddock grazing or, or holistic management will do for you. Um, will improve the fungi and fungi turn out to be very important in in the health of soils and the, the subsoil ecosystem and so are bacteria um, and earthworms I think we probably all know already are very important to soil health uh, in terms of cycling the humus and the, the vegetative the decaying uh, vegetative matter all of those three actually do that and having those healthy organisms below the soil will improve the health above the soil. Uh, there's a picture, I'm not sure if you can make it out on the top right of that slide, uh, of a dung beetle. And uh, there have been a lot of, well, there have been several studies of the cycling of nutrients by dung beetles and, and the speed with which they can move dung into the soil. Now, dung beetles aren't native to every environment but in environments where they are native and work for, and some environments where they've been introduced for example in Australia where they've introduced some African dung beetles they've been extremely positive in terms of the um, rate at which dung patches are incorporated into soil and basically what that means is you're incorporating that carbon into the soil more rapidly and uh, means you lose less of it to the atmosphere. So dung beetles are extremely positive uh, in, in most grazing lands because they, they clear up and uh, deposit the, the dung right into the soil, which is where you really want the dung to be. Now the, the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is um, a multi-stakeholder initiative and soil health and, and good grazing management are one of the things that we focus on so our organization has a number of principles um, around environment so natural resources obviously that's the one most pertaining to to what i've been talking about and what all of, all of your webinars have been about then we also have principle on animal health and welfare and again i would say that good grazing management and good uh, livestock husbandry in general uh, is a huge part of animal health and welfare. The third one uh, relates to food safety and uh, that's that's some, really a precondition for selling livestock products and, and not so much pertaining to grazing but food safety is an important uh, 
an important issue to the global uh, beef industry, of course. Then we have uh, a principle on people and the community, um, which is really about two aspects. Uh, people in the community relates to both the, the, the labor rights and the way in which people who work in the beef industry are treated and uh, the way that uh, people who are on the land have access to the land, that pe the, the rights of, for example, uh, indigenous people to land in some countries, I was talking about the difficulties they have in um, in some African countries with the management of communal resources. So that's all part of that people in the community aspect. And the last one is efficiency and innovation. And I think that's another important one for grazing lands because in addition to all of the benefits that uh, we talked about, um, improving grazing management, improving carbon in the soil, improving moisture retention, etc. Good grazing management also improves your productivity and improves uh, your ability to actually um, generate an income from your land and it will make uh, production more efficient. And that, that kind of goes without saying, if you're talking about good grazing management, it means you're, you're managing your grazing to optimize um, for a set of uh, choices that the producer has made. Now that will obviously, in the case of livestock, in, include the production of uh, beef, so more kilograms of beef per hectare, for example, but it'll also be for all of the other ecosystem um, benefits that uh, can be derived from grazing management. And I'm not sure if this is yet the case in Canada. I know that there's been a lot of discussion in Canada about uh, carbon taxes and, and producers are quite resistant to it. But given the fact that uh, the soils of grazing lands around the world uh, sequester billions of tons of carbon, I think it's probably an area that uh, we should be more interested in because if we can demonstrate that producers are actually locking carbon up in the soil and taking it out of the atmosphere, then there would also be a good rationale for paying for that. And Australia has recently paid um, or the, the first trading of carbon sequestration certificates has taken place in Australia in the last couple of weeks. And that is rewarding producers financially for looking after their land well. So it's a double win for those producers. Their land is improving in health, so it's becoming more productive. It's having an ecosystem, ecosystem benefit, and, and most producers, in fact, all producers I know, um, want their land to be in better health. It's, it's a logical thing to want, because it means you can pass it on in better condition to the next generation, or it'll be worth more if you if you decide to get out of uh, agriculture altogether. So there are, there are serious uh, incentives for producers to, to do this. And as I said, Australian producers are now actually getting paid for sequestering carbon in the soil, which is, which is great news. As you can see from this map, we've got uh, initiatives around the world that are all members of uh, the Global Roundtable. Um, Canada is, is one of the leading members. They got off the starting blocks quite rapidly in 2014 and have been very active um, in pursuing a system within Canada that's good for producers. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association is behind it. And uh, there seems to be good buy-in there. And Canada was the first uh, country to sell certified sustainable beef. That was also, is available in McDonald's stores now in Canada. So that was a, a great win. Canada was the first there. The US round table is moving fast to try and, uh, and catch up. And then we have several in Latin America. Brazilian Roundtable has actually been going for even longer than, than the GRSB. It was established in 2000 and, um, 2010. And they have big challenges, of course, around deforestation. Um, it's, it's working well, but it's an extremely challenging environment to work in. And then we have the Paraguayan and Argentinian roundtables. And the Mexican one is really just in formation, so that's why it's a different color. Oh, Colombia, I also didn't mention. 
Then in Europe, we have one European roundtable, which is encompassing um, initiatives throughout Europe. So there are several national initiatives, but they're not really roundtables, but all together, they come together as one roundtable. And the same is true of Southern Africa. And then Australia has something they call a framework because it's not, it doesn't have as many types of members. They don't have NGOs, for example. New Zealand is launching a roundtable this year. And uh, China, where I've just been and just came back from last week, has a, a roundtable and quite some interest in the concept, but they're really just uh, getting to grips with the whole, whole idea at the moment. And when you see the challenges that the China uh, beef industry is facing, both in terms of what they produce locally, but also in terms of what they import, the China one is going to be very important, but they, they have a long road uh, to travel yet. Uh, some of our members, so McDonald's in particular, has been funding research into um, AMP grazing, so what I've been talking about, uh, the adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And there are, actually there are 21 researchers, I think uh, this quote is out of date. So there are 21 researchers around the US involved in this project. And Peter Bick, who's the science coordinator for the project, is, is really enthusiastic enthusiastic about this. Now, I don't know if you've ever come across uh, a video called Soil Carbon Cowboys or any of the Carbon Nation movies. Those are all made by Peter Bick, who's uh, a professor at Arizona State, but he's also a film producer. And he, if you haven't come across them, I do recommend visiting his website because some of them are really inspirational. Um, the way that uh, ranchers have managed to recover their land uh, through this um, AMP grazing. And the research that these organizations are doing now um, is going to establish scientifically what the parameters are for this type of uh, management and really get a handle on how beneficial it can be for the environment. So the first of those papers is in preparation now. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see some some really encouraging news coming out from that uh, working group. And I'm sure that um, the Canadian and the US roundtables and certainly my own organization will be sharing that uh, widely as it, as it does come out. For a very specific uh, case study, um, this farm in uh, southeastern Australia called Talaheni, it's a wool producing farm, but uh, no problem. Uh, grazing ruminants are can, can be good whether they're cattle or sheep. So in that case, which was studied over a period of 20 years from its purchase till, uh, till a couple of years ago, the increases in the soil carbon alone uh, on that farm were enough to more than offset all of the emissions from production, and that includes the, the use of fossil fuels, uh, the emissions from the animals themselves, and all of the other energy and inputs that they use on the farm. And the carbon storage in soils and trees combined was more than 11 times as much as was emitted by livestock and energy. So that was a phenomenal example of the benefits you can get by combining um, holistic management in their case, uh, which was certainly amp grazing, but also combined with um, using trees throughout the farm to set up shade and uh, shelter belts and these kind of things. 11 times as much uh, as was emitted. So I think that's an extremely positive example. And if you're interested in finding a reference to that, uh, the paper was published by CSIRO, um, and the lead author was uh, called Doran Brown. So if you look up, uh, if you're interested in finding the paper, you'll be able to find it by Googling Tallahenny, uh, Doran Brown, and CSIRO. And if you want to read a book which is more targeted, I guess, at a, um, an interested but a lay audience. So not much, not so much a scientific uh, publication, but a, a really good read with lots of um, lots of Australian examples. It is an Australian book. I do recommend this book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, by Charles Massey, and he basically travelled around Australia looking at lots of different farms where they've been implementing various versions of what he uh, refers to as regenerative management. And he covered crop farms, he covered uh, 
livestock ranches and com uh, combined farms where they are using crops and livestock together. And he has a wealth of uh, very positive examples where livestock has been used to restore the health of ecosystems in Australia, uh, whereas previously, um, you know, previous management systems, what I guess he would refer to as conventional management systems, had caused uh, degradation over the years. So there are lots of examples, and uh, if you've got any more questions or ex want to know about examples from other countries, I'd, I'd be happy to share them. So that's uh, me finished talking for just now, but I'm very happy to uh, to answer any questions that you may have. And uh, you can find my website there on the slide, and uh, feel free to follow us on either Instagram or Twitter. That's the GRSB zone one, and my my handle is uh, my own name, Rory, and then P for my surname, Peter. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, we'd be happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. That was an awesome presentation. It's so nice to have a global perspective of the importance of grasslands and grazing and, and soil carbon. So thank you very much for that. I know um, I made a note to look at the soil carbon cowboys. That sounds pretty awesome. So um, it looks like it's a 12 minute video. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. There's, he's made several, and I can recommend that one, certainly. Uh, the 12-minute one, Soil Carbon Cows, uh, Cowboys, is excellent. There's another one called, I think it's A Million Beating Hearts, which is also quite inspirational about one particular farm. And if you want uh, examples from closer to Canada, he's not actually in Canada, it's just south of the border for you guys, but uh, uh, there's a guy called Gabe Brown, uh, who's also worth looking up on YouTube. He's a regenerative uh, producer, combining both livestock and crops. Um, he's done some great YouTube videos as well. Cool. That sounds awesome. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. And if you do need to leave the webinar, a short survey will pop up. If you don't mind filling that out, um, I think it'll also get emailed to you after as well. Uh, we really appreciate any answers that we can get. And it goes to doing this event in the future. And yeah. <laughs> um, so Rory, we do have a couple questions here from listeners. Um, a listener named Jessica would like to know a little bit more about dung beetles, and she says, with respect to dung beetles, is there an issue in other countries of insecticide treatment of livestock that hinders insect communities in the dung piles? Um, I guess the short answer to that is yes. Um, so if you're using especially poron um, products, or any product which will have a, a latency in the dung, that is going to cause uh, problems for dung beetles. And I guess one of the one of the key issues for these healthy environments is that um, all of these biota are sensitive to to overuse or misuse of chemicals, and all of these biota reinforce each other. So where you've got a healthy environment with uh, with all of the things I talked about in the soil and dung beetles, um, your need for extensive chemical uh, preparations will be reduced. But that's not to say it will be eliminated altogether, and I know that there's always going to be situations in which people have to treat animals with, uh, with uh, various preparations, whether they're anthelmintics or, or, or ecto- um, what are they called? Acaricides, sorry, so that's anti-tick treatments. An anti-tick treatment would, would certainly cause an issue for dung beetles if it was to be um, widespread throughout the environment. So, for example, in parts of Africa where you have to, where you have to dip cattle to avoid things, uh, obesiosis or whatever else, uh, tick-borne diseases you've got, you would have an issue uh, near dip tanks and, and where cattle are shedding dip if they get released onto the pasture too quickly after dipping. So the, the situation there is, if you're gonna to have to be dipping cattle, um, you need to keep them in the, in the yards for some time so that the acaricide is basically dry before they go back to pasture. You want to be sure that you're not getting um, more than is absolutely necessary going back to pasture. Thank you for that answer. 
Um, we have a question here from a listener named Jerry, um, and I'm going to send it out too because it's long. Um, so Jerry says, can you implement AMP grazing in large tracts of native grasslands, example, semi-arid community pastures without the need to have a lot of rotation fences, similar to the slides of zebra in Botswana, common to have on these kinds of pastures, multiple breeding and non-breeding pastures, which is a challenge to provide effective rest especially when we have dry years? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and um, it, it's been done, and there are a number of uh, ways to think about this. So I've got a couple of examples. Um, one is from Namibia, where actually that last slide there with the calf looking back over its shoulder, that is from Namibia. And in this area, Obviously, that animal's in the stockade at the moment. But um, in that area, we worked with a community uh, on the communal grazing. So again, uh, this is an area that had been s severely overgrazed in the past because essentially all of the community members were sending their cattle, cattle out um, separately. And that meant that every part of the grazing lands was getting grazed regularly and there was no rotation. What happened in that community was they, they came together and with, uh, with a local organization who helped us facilitate this whole thing. Um, they, were, they were trained in what rotational, or, or in their case, they don't call it amp grazing because they don't actually have paddocks. It's, it's called rotational grazing. They were trained on basically herding techniques. So the herders were trained on what the pasture should look like and when to move the animals and you know they all come back to the kraal every night anyway so what they would do is they'd go out to one area one day the next day they'd go to uh, you know another segment and essentially they would rotate the grazing day by day as a whole community and those herders turned out to be extremely valuable uh, within three years of that project starting the the rangeland was recovering uh, very well and uh, those herders were in high demand. So commercial ranchers were coming to the community to try and hi hire those herders away from the community because they saw the, the, the benefits of the grazing land. So that's an example in a country like Namibia where you've got um, ready and available labor. The other example I can give you is from Australia, and, and that might be more relevant to your Canadian situation. And I, I can't uh, know whether in your situation you've got perpetual water, because the key in the Australian system was essentially moving cattle to where water was. And by moving and turning on and off water sources, you could actually control the area where the cattle were grazing without fences. So you can actually end up, um, so that there are some extremely large ran ranches in central Australia, and there's basically no natural surface water from most of the year, or in fact, most of several years. They occasionally have rainfall that gives them surface water, but it's gone within within weeks. So in those situations, you might have a paddock, and it's a bit of a misnomer, I always thought, but they have paddocks there of up to a thousand square kilometers, which is well, how many? That's 100,000 hectares. It's extraordinarily, extraordinarily large paddock. And the way they control the grazing on that is they have windmills uh, pumping water into uh, large tanks and then a trough coming out of the tank. And you can turn off the windmill and drove the cattle to the next water point. And that way the cattle will always stay within easy grazing distance of the water point and you can control the grazing quite well in, in a situation like that. So I don't know if that's analogous to anything that you'd see in Canada, but that those are the two examples that I can give. Awesome. Thank you for that. They're two very different examples, but kind of gives a, a, I don't know, thinking outside the box and a different perspective. So thank you for that answer. Um, that looks like all the questions that we have. So um, with that, I, I know it's late where you are, Ruri. So thank you so much for your time and for the awesome presentation. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, thanks so much for, for tuning in. And with that, have a great rest of your day, everyone. And hopefully wherever you are, it's a beautiful spring day like I have here in southwest Saskatchewan. So thank you and have a great day. Brilliant. Thank you very much.
Bye. Bye.